Today we begin a new long-term sermon series on the book of 2 Corinthians, a New Testament letter written by the Apostle Paul to a church in the city of Corinth. However, today we're not going to go directly to that book to begin. Instead, we're going to start to get our minds around the ideas of New Testament, Paul, Corinth, church, those sorts of things. By, by first, today, looking at Acts chapter 18, with the account of how Paul first came to this city to start a church there. By Acts 18, Paul is in the middle of what is known as his second missionary journey. He's traveling through what is modern, basically modern Turkey and modern Greece, taking every opportunity to talk to people there about what God has done in Christ, what God has done in Jesus to save human beings from their sin back into relationship with him. That's God's message. That's Paul's message. That's what's called the good news, the gospel. Not what we do, but what God has done in Christ to reconcile people to himself. If you're at all familiar with the book of Acts, you know that wherever Paul goes, he talks about that to just about anybody who will listen. Businesswomen and slave girls and convicts and jailers in Philippi, Acts, Acts chapter 16, and then the best and the brightest university scholars in the land in Athens, and that's in Acts chapter 17. It's, it's the whole gamut of people. Paul talks to everyone. He is a man on fire. He's a man's man. He is strong and tough and in the moment bold and abidingly supremely confident. At least that's how we often think of him. We read that kind of record. We look at Acts 16 or 17 or wherever. We read that kind of record and, and we think, holy smokes, that is obviously some sort of a superman there. He is just fearless. I mean, a demon-possessed girl, demon-possessed. It's face to face with a demon. And then locked in a jail cell in the dark, with who knows who. And then the best and the brightest, the, the scholars. I would be so intimidated in those settings. Whew. I mean, never mind that. I'm so intimidated in my own settings, talking to my neighbor, to my coworker, to my family members. Is that you? Ever been afraid to bring up the gospel? or afraid to even think about how to try to start a spiritual conversation of some sort. Most of us have. All of us have. Paul included. We've all been afraid in those situations. The Apostle Paul included. He was more like us than we tend to think. Now, certainly, of course, yes, Paul is... Paul's a unique guy. He, he's an apostle of Christ. He's someone who saw the risen Christ. It was a requirement of being an apostle. He had to be able to say, I've seen the risen Christ. Paul saw him and, and was called to a unique job and given some unique gifts. And yeah, So he's a little bit different than us for sure. Yet sometimes even Paul was afraid, like here. If we were to read 1 Corinthians chapter 2, what we find there is Paul revealing to everybody what it was like for him, what his attitude was like when he walked into this famous city. He writes there, I came in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. He was afraid, but he came. And God met him there and worked through him in some wonderful ways. That's what we're going to look at a little bit here in Acts chapter 18. We see Paul, and we see God deal with Paul in, in the middle of what is a fearful situation and, and what would be an intimidating environment. And if we look at that, what we're going to do is we're going to think about how what Jesus did with Paul is also what he means to do with us to help us face our fears, the, the intimidating situations that we look at as we try to figure out how can I approach someone to help them be reconciled to God. That's what we're going to look at today in Acts 18. Let me read the passage. This is 
Acts 18, the first 17 verses. I'm going to read it all and then pass back through it to help us um, quickly, to help us just catch a few of the details and then draw two observations, mostly from verses 9 and 10, where Jesus speaks. So follow along as I read Acts 18, beginning in verse 1. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. He found a Jew named Aquila, native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. When they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent. For I am with you and no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. But when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying, This man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it is a matter of questions about words and names in your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of these things. And he drove them from the tribunal. And they all seized Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Gallio paid no attention to any of this. Paul left Athens by himself and headed about 50 miles or so west to the city of Corinth. Corinth was a fascinating place. Geographically, think of Greece as kind of like a, a tilted, misshapen hourglass with two large, large bodies of land connected in the middle by a very narrow neck of only about three miles width. And right there at that narrow neck, that's where Corinth was. And this location shaped the makeup of the city for centuries, first as a, as a Greek city, and then after it was conquered, destroyed, and resettled by Rome as the Roman colony it was when Paul came. This location, in this narrow neck, meant that Corinth had two ports, one on each side and each body of water. And so traded goods could come from one sea and either hit the roads going north or south and go through all that land area or go through the city and out the other port, cutting off the long travel around the, the body of Greece. So it was a major intersection of commerce, which meant that it was wealthy. There was a lot of money in Corinth, always easy money. And furthermore, as a crossroads of land and sea, it was a people magnet. Some estimate that there may have been close to a million people in Corinth at the time Paul arrived there. Made it one of the largest cities in the entire Roman Empire. And there were people from just everywhere, a large number of Roman citizens and former slaves who had founded the place, but then people came from everywhere. It was an extremely culturally diverse city. Additionally, it also had a clear reputation for an anything-goes sexual ethic. Probably a little less so than during its Greek days, but still quite pronounced. It's New York City, Miami, Los Angeles, with a bit of Vegas kind of mixed in. 
a massive, extremely wealthy, sexually permissive, culturally diverse, cosmopolitan, that is, international city. That's Corinth, when Paul walked into it all by himself in the fall of the year A.D. 50, the only Christian that he knew in town come to start a church in Corinth. Now, there were, in fact, a couple other Christians there. We, we see Aquila and, and Priscilla. He met them, and they became lifelong friends of his. And then a couple of other missionary partners of his arrived and joined with him in the ministry, and the ministry did bear some fruit. See, the synagogue ruler came to faith, and a number of local Corinthian Greeks also believed. But in the size of Corinth, that's just a drop in the bucket. It, Corinth is still Corinth. It is still worldly, and it is still non-Christian. And as you see, there's a lot of hostility. This concerted attack is just one of the things that opposed Paul. Paul came in fear, and there remained much, much to feed fear in his heart in Corinth. So, the Lord Jesus came to him in the night in a vision, and spoke to him. That's what we're going to look at more closely here in a moment, verses 9 and 10. And after Jesus spoke, Paul stayed another year and a half or so. He's probably there just, just under two years in total, probably. He stayed, the church was planted, began to grow, and then he moved on. That's the text. The center of which is Verses 9 and 10, if you're ever looking at a passage and you see Jesus speaking, it's probably good to focus your attention on those words, and that's what we're going to be looking at this morning. We're going to, we're going to look at Jesus and what he said, and, and essentially, if I sum it up in, in a sentence, it's he spoke to Paul and said, Paul, I want you to speak boldly, for I am with you to accomplish my saving purposes. That, that's our main point this morning. Speak boldly because I'm with you to accomplish my saving purposes. I'm going to draw out two observations from those verses in support of that, that main idea. So here's the first. God has given us a solemn responsibility as ministers of gospel reconciliation. God has given us a solemn responsibility as ministers of gospel reconciliation. We see the responsibility in the command that Jesus gave to Paul in verse 9. The Lord appears to him and very clearly instructs him. He commands him. This is, this is not optional. It's not a vice. It's a command. Speak. Don't be silent. Speak. Now, he doesn't mean chatter away nonstop. What he means is don't be silenced. Be speaking. Be without fear. That, that's also a command. If you, if you notice the language there, it's you know, do not be afraid is also a command. But that's not the main point. It's not, it's not that God's goal is that Paul be without fear. It's that fear would lead him to be silenced and stop the bottom line goal of gospel proclamation for the reconciliation of people to God. That's the point. Speak. Proclaim the gospel of the grace of God that has come only in Christ. And speak continually, not just once. It's to be an ongoing habit. He says, go on speaking. Just be about this. This is your habit speaking about the sober news. If you think about what we just looked at in the book of Joel a number of weeks past here, if you think about that, that's, that's sobering reality. That needs to be spoken of. Speak of the sobering news of the coming wrath of God against the sin of all humankind. The sin of all humankind and the sin of all humans the sin that's in our heart that leads us all to turn away from God and to worship, that is to, to, to turn to and trust and love and follow and seek after everything under the sun except God. Speak about that to people. And probably, 
as we love people and, and are close to them and understand them and see their lives, we're also going to be thinking about and speaking about this other aspect of sin, not just the trouble that it makes for us with God, but the trouble that it makes for us with us. Speak about that too. Sin, is, sin creates a problem between us and the holy God, and sin wrecks us. And as we get close to people, make, make the connection. See, this is not just an issue of authority. It's an issue. You can't live well. So speak about that, too. Make, make the connection. Show the sorrow that sin brings us, the wreckage that it sin builds into our lives and into our world. Speak about that, too, and about the coming judgment of that. And make the connections that that would then be, wouldn't it, would, think about this, wouldn't it be good for God to judge that which wrecks people? And he's going to. Judge that which wrecks people. Sin. Speak about the problem that sin creates between us and God and the problem that it creates between us and us. Speak about that and then by all means, speak about the hope of God's wrath removed and the sin problem solved. Point out that that only happens in Jesus crucified where God's wrath can be poured out on him and in place of that, the grace and the mercy and the love of God poured out on those who trust in Jesus. Speak about that. Paul, that's your responsibility. Speak. It's been his responsibility since the day that he saved him on the road to Damascus. That's why he saved him, in fact. To make Paul a unique instrument of witness. But be careful there. It's a unique instrument. Talk about the road to Damascus, and it's easy for us to say, that's really different, that's really other, that's, that's not me. Paul's unique. But Paul's uniqueness lies in the scope of his calling, the authority of his calling, the power bestowed on him, the manner in which he would then discharge that calling, the general nature speak about the gospel that reconciles people to God. The general nature of that calling is not unique to Paul. Everybody in the book of Acts does that. Paul's ministry companions, Silas and Timothy and Barnabas, they're doing the very same thing as Paul. Other apostles, like Peter. Other named characters, Philip, the deacon Stephen. Other unnamed, countless other unnamed people. We read about the church in Antioch or the church in Jerusalem multiplying as unnamed, common, ordinary Christians, comma, just like us, speak. Which shouldn't surprise us because, in fact, as we saw a couple months ago, that's the point of the, the header verse of the whole book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 8. Wait, and I will pour out my spirit on you, the church, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. That's all of us. You will receive power, and he will, remember this, he will cleanse you and thereby equip you in person and then with power and word to be my witnesses. You're given the Spirit for you, for others. Acts 1.8 says that's the church. That's all of us. Paul's got a unique silo. Yeah, for sure. He's, he's different, but he's the same. Every person. It's our responsibility to pray for opportunity to love people and to be near them. To not be afraid to be silent and be silent, but rather to, to speak the gospel that God may use his word to honor his name and save people. This is all of our responsibility, and I think that's one of the things that God wants to remind us of this morning and reminded Paul of it that night. 
and it is a solemn responsibility. It's a command from the Lord. That, that's Solomon itself. But there's a little bit more that kind of turns this and makes it like, ooh. Look at verse 6. When Paul starts in the Jewish synagogue, as, as was usually his custom, he, he has some time there of, of being allowed to state his case and talk with them and banter back and forth. But eventually they say, enough, get out. They don't want anything more to do with it, and they reject him. And as he's leaving, he says, your blood be on your own heads, I am innocent. Which isn't just some spiteful comment. It's actually an allusion to the words of the prophet Ezekiel in chapter 33 of Ezekiel. This is sobering. If we were to look back in Ezekiel, we'd see that what's going on there is that the people of Israel are, are, are wandering way far away from God, and he is dealing with them in catastrophic consequences. And he's telling Ezekiel, you're my spokesperson, you're, you're to speak about these judgments, to give them warning. And he sets up for Ezekiel there in that chapter uh, a word picture, and he depicts Ezekiel the prophet and the people of Israel, maybe you could say like the city of Jerusalem, as like a watchman and a city. And he says... A watchman, the job is to warn the city of a coming disaster. And if you do that, Ezekiel, if you warn and the people don't listen, well, okay, their blood will be on their own heads, what Paul quoted here. However, God also mentions the opposite possibility. What if the watchman knows the disaster is coming but says nothing? Does nothing. Doesn't beat a drum, sound a trumpet, light a fire, turn on the lights, run through the streets. Does nothing. Doesn't attempt to warn. Well, their blood will be on their own head still in some way, yes. He's, he's talking about responsibility for sin. So yes, people are responsible for their own sin. But he also says, in some way the watchman's responsible, isn't he? Ezekiel? some way the watchman's responsible. You, you saw it coming and said nothing. Paul's saying here, I spoke, so I'm innocent. It's on you. But if he hadn't spoken, he couldn't say. He's read Ezekiel. He knows, I couldn't say. I'm, I'm innocent. He'd say, I bear, I bear some responsibility for this. Not ultimately. It is you for you. You're accountable for you. But do you see the solemn responsibility that God lays on Ezekiel and that Paul says, that's me too. Applied by Paul to Paul's situation, which by extension also applies to us as witnesses also. The uniqueness of Ezekiel's position and of Paul's position is its scope and authority and power and gifting and therefore its manner. But we are all in the mission with different scope and authority and giftings and manner for sure. But if you remember again, 2 Timothy, where we talked about Timothy's calling as a pastor, we talked about minister with a capital M and minister with a lowercase m. Some people, Ezekiel, Paul, Timothy, minister with a capital M. All Christians, ministers with a lowercase m. All Christians filled with the Spirit that you may be my witnesses. It's all of us, guys. It's all of us. Not the same way, but it's all of us. We're all ministers, and we all then have some part in the ministry of reconciliation, some way that you can serve and love and someone that you can pray for and speak to. So who is it for you and where? There's some place for you that you could look at and say, you know, I, I think probably I am the minister for this little field here. 
Nobody else even knows these people. Nobody else is around these people. Nobody lives here next to this one. I, I bet you, I bet you a dollar they're on my farm. Who is it for you? Because there is, there is some place in which you have some responsibility here for some people in some way. Who? Start by thinking about that and then praying. Start by thinking about that and then praying. Praying. Praying, moving towards them as a true friend. Love them. Care for them. Pray for them. Pray for opportunity to speak and then watch for it. That's where I usually fall down. I, I, I can do the first part of that, and then I'm not actually looking for opportunity to speak. Maybe I'm not praying enough either. But I, but I can befriend people, but I'm not actually thinking about and praying for. Lord, would you bring up life stuff? Would you create depth and relationship here? Would you give me eyes to see opportunity to speak about Jesus, to point out the problems that sin caused, to talk about an answer that is full of grace and love, Pray, draw near to people and love them, and look for opportunities to speak and don't be silenced. He's given you a spirit and he's given you a solemn responsibility. Not in all the same ways and certainly, certainly not in any obnoxious or overbearing or domineering Ways, no manipulation, no coercion. We, we wanted to say, take a gigantic step back from any kind of a power play. No. Just by simple statement of the truth. That's how we speak. And if a friend or a neighbor or relative won't listen, well, that's not up to us. That, that's not up to us. But the praying and the loving and the speaking is. So, there. Now, can we say, do you feel like this not right now? If so, let me let my hand off that. Bring your arm back around. I am not trying to twist your arm and, and jam you into the mission. I'm not. Don't feel manipulated or guilt-tripped. Don't. You're not accountable to me. I'm not trying to make you do something. But I do want to point out this, and you look at that and say, I think I buy that. I think I buy the book of Acts. I think I buy Acts 1-8. I think I buy that. And sit you before God and say, Lord, I know you don't deal with me in manipulation and coercion. But you do deal with me, he does deal with you, with command and with grace. We're going to talk a little bit about the, the next point is about some of the grace that underlies that command and can enable us, but, but we've got to face this and say, is this actually about me? From a God who loves me, he doesn't coerce me, he doesn't, to, he doesn't need me, he doesn't need you, he doesn't. But if he's actually spoken this to you, he wants to use you in some way, so face that, you before him, not before us, or before me, you before him. It is a job for all of us, but I gotta be clear here, I, I've, I've mentally checked out of many of many such passages and many such teachings because I felt like somehow the preacher just like manipulated me. I didn't like that. So I'm trying to step away from all kinds of manipulation and coercion here and I want to put you before God and say you deal with that with him as he speaks to you through this passage. If you buy it, then respond to him. And I think that to respond to him something we all need to deal with is the issue of fear. And 
just knowing what I'm supposed to do is not usually quite enough to get me over the fear hump. There's got to be something else here, and I think there is something else here. It's our second point. So, first, he's given us a solemn responsibility as ministers of the gospel. And second, he's given us a remarkable promise to reinforce us in our responsibility. A remarkable promise to reinforce or to steady, to, to support our wavering hearts as we, we look at this responsibility. And it's, it's one of those promises that I'm going to, when I, when I say it and, and kind of tease it out over the rest of the sermon, could easily be like, yeah, I got that theology, check. This is the trump card over all fear. Verse 10. Fearlessly go on speaking. Don't be silent. For I am with you. And there's a little bit of a, of a twist. In the, the I am linguistically is linked to the, the name of the Lord. I am with you. The promise of the powerful presence of the risen and reigning King. This is the central reality won for you by the gospel. The presence, the, the companionship, the, the union of God with you in Christ. Do you realize, do, do you like regularly think about that's what the gospel's about? And that early we talked about sin and, and wrath and wrath removed by Jesus' death on the cross. And if if that's how you if that's the, the end of how you think about the gospel, that, that's, that, that's the heart of what happened, is the heart of what God did. But if you think about it just like that only, the end result of that is, whew, wrath is no longer on me. Kind of like, I'm no longer in trouble. Well, that's good, but that's comma for something more. That, that's a negative statement. Is there a positive part of that? Indeed there is. From the sinner's perspective, I'm no longer in trouble, comma, so I get God back. You and I were born fallen, sinful people, alienated from God. Separated from Him. But in the cross, as we trust Christ's payment for sin, that sin, that wrath, that, that gap is removed and we are reconciled. This becomes a big word in Corinthians. We are reconciled, brought back to him. We get God back. So that from the moment of your salvation, he says of you, I am with you, strong to deliver you. I delivered you from sin and I will one day deliver you completely from any trouble and any presence of sin and any temptation. And in the intervening years, as you live and walk through this world of trouble and tribulation, I am with you to deliver, to deliver, to deliver, to deliver, to deliver. Who can be against you? Think about that. I am with you This is the one. P Paul, would, Paul would hear that and would think, oh, oh, this is the one who cast out that slave girl's demon and broke him out of jail in Philippi. He didn't do that. The Lord with him did. He's the one who made the lame to walk in Lystra and the one who blinded Elemus on Cyprus. Paul saw those things with his own eyes. Keep moving back through the book of Acts. This I am is the one who struck down Herod in his pride and who freed Peter from prison and raised Dorcas from the dead and healed Aeneas from paralysis after he poured out his spirit on all the church, after he ascended to heaven in the cloud, after he came out of the grave alive again. 
He's the Lord I am. The Lord of heaven and earth, the King, the King. It, we sometimes sweetly and beautifully sit beneath the idea, and I'm going to talk about this in a moment here, the idea of Jesus as shepherd. And in a lot of our pain and a lot of our hurt and a lot of our brokenness, we need the idea of Jesus as shepherd and we need to hear him call us tenderly and draw us to and, and love us and be near to us and, and deal with us like this. But there are sometimes king fits better. And when you walk into a city of a million people like Corinth all by yourself, king fits better. He's the king over nature and he's the king of the spiritual realm and he's the king over the church and he's the king over all people everywhere and he's the king on a throne with you. He's the king. When you trusted in the gospel, you were reconnected with him, to him, made his friend. And he's with you and will be with you in all things in life, in, in all moments, in everything. Now, this passage, as we're going to see, has a particular application. It's going somewhere in particular with that. But it's worth just for a second pausing and realizing that if you're a Christian, he's with you in every step, in everything in life. And, and right now, it, it's, it's certainly possible that some, some of us here right now are thinking, I would love to be fully concentrating on the message that you're talking about. And... I, I really want to engage with that, but there's this screaming issue of, I mean, kind of like pick it these days, right? Pick the screaming issue. There's this screaming issue yelling at me, yelling at my family, yelling at my loved one. I'm trying to pay attention, but this, this job loss, this financial pressure, this health concern, this, this turmoil, and they just yell. Okay. He wants to talk about he's with you for that, but he's also with you for this. And he's the king over that, too. He is. All kinds of stuff. He's the king with you in all kinds of stuff. So who can be against you and what do you have to fear in all kinds of stuff? believe that? It's true. So set all kinds of stuff over here with him and let's follow where he wants to go in this passage. It's a remarkable promise about the presence of God in Christ and it's got a particular reason, a particular way that it encourages us, encourages us in, this, in this witnessing responsibility here. Verse 10 continues and explains it. This is maybe a bit odd. We've got to think through this a little bit. I am with you, and no one will attack you to harm you. No harm will befall you. Because God never allows harmful attacks against Christians, ever. Not hardly. Paul's own life is full of that. Stoned, beaten, rejected, he's going to get his head chopped off. It's not because God never allows harmful attacks ever. It's just not in this case. Why not? So, so that's not the promise to us. I'm with you and nothing's going to harm you. That's not the promise. Let's keep reading. No harm's going to befall you because, for I have many people in this city. Not many Christians, many going to be Christians. The people here, whom Jesus is talking about at the end of verse 10, are not people who are currently Christians. If we switch context and use different words here, they would be the sheep that Jesus talks about in John 10, for instance. my scattered sheep in the other nations that I'm going to go and call. My scattered sheep in Corinth, 
say. That I'm going to go and call, and they'll hear my voice and they'll come. Jesus talks like that in John 10. That's who he's, that's who he's talking about here. Sprinkled among the Gentiles, many even in this city. But they have to believe yet. And how are they going to believe? They haven't heard the gospel. So he sent Paul to talk, to speak. The Bible calls them in other places sheep, or in other places calls them the elect of God, given to the Son by the Father, and right now about to be called in by the voice of the shepherd in Paul's accent. There are many of my people here, Paul. They're here in this city, and that's why I brought you here. Because they're mine by election, but they don't become saved and forgiven until they hear the gospel of grace and believe it, and so speak it, and I'm going to speak through you, and they will hear, and they will come, and until all of those many come, you're bulletproof. I'm going to stand around you like a wall of iron, and no harm will befall you. When I'm done, then they'll cut your head off. But not till. See, the promise is not they're never going to harm you. The promise is this works. Because it's not my mission. It's not my gifting, not my power, not my cleverness, not my persuasive ability. It says he tried to persuade Jews and Greeks, but it's not Paul's persuasive ability. It's the Spirit of God in him persuading them. It's the voice of Jesus in him calling them. And Paul, Christian, this works. I call all my sheep. They hear my voice. And because they are my sheep and it's my voice, they come. That's Jesus in John 10. That's what's behind this. I have many people here. I'm calling them through you. We don't have any idea who they are, but he does. And he promises us that he's pursuing them all with us and through us successfully. I think one of the issues that we face is I don't know how to do this, and I'm not very good at it, and I stumble over my words, and I get really embarrassed, and, 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 and behind all that is I'm with you as king and I reign, and I'm doing it. You don't know what I do. I'm doing it. Your job, pray, love, speak. And my promise to you is I'm with you, and that works. That works. I am accomplishing my purposes. Pray, love, speak. And leave the rest to God. This is a, if you think through this, I think this is a, a very solid underpinning for, for ministry, and, a, and it's close to the taproot of fearlessness. The presence of the king doing his work. I, I regularly think, and I regularly pray, with the pronoun, I think it's pro pronoun, your, possessive pronoun, your. Lord, this is your work. Lord, this is your word. It is your spirit who does this. These are your people. This is your environment. This is your, 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 your. I regularly pray like that, and I find that when I'm actually thinking like that, not just mouthing the words, but I'm praying and thinking like that, there is a, a, a relaxing that isn't passivity, a relaxing that is actually confidence. It doesn't, it doesn't feel like, but it's, but it's actually, a, I'm. so it's up to you to, to accomplish what you want to do with your work and your word and your spirit and in your environment here in your world. So you do it, and I guess I'm along for the ride. I'm going to pray and love and speak and leave it up to you. 
That is very helpful. That's what he's saying here to Paul and what he's saying here to us. We have a solemn responsibility and a great promise. The presence of God who will accomplish his saving purpose as you speak his word. Let me pray. Father, in a lot of ways, I'm preaching over my own head here because I still struggle with fear. We all do. So, Father, will you take now this passage and press it into us and remind us, to, to convince us before you that we have a responsibility and then remind us that you're at work with us and in us to carry it out actually yourself. Would you build a people who are gracious and loving and kind witnesses and who are confident and bold witnesses for you? Make us wise. Make us wise when and how and who and where. Would you please use us increasingly? Use our church increasingly. This is probably not a strength of our church as a whole, but would you, would you use our church increasingly so, Lord, to to speak about this message to the world that needs to hear it. Help us, please, we pray. Thank you. Amen.